Section 1. In the Beginning Chapter 1. Why was sin permitted? God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. His nature, His law is love. It ever has been. It ever will be. The high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose ways are everlasting, changeth not. With him is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 6. James chapter 1, verse 17. Every manifestation of creative power is an expression of infinite love. The sovereignty of God involves fullness of blessing to all created beings. The psalmist says, Strong is thy hand, and high is thy right hand. Righteousness and judgment are the foundation of thy throne. Mercy and truth go before thy face. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. In thy name do they rejoice all the day, and in thy righteousness are they exalted. For thou art the glory of their strength. For our shield belongeth unto Jehovah, and our King to the Holy One. Psalm 89, verses 13 to 18, in the Revised Version. In this text, and in some other Bible quotations used in this book, the word Jehovah is employed instead of Lord, as rendered in the American supplement to the Revised Version. The history of the great conflict between good and evil, from the time it first began in heaven, to the final overthrow of rebellion, and the total eradication of sin is also a demonstration of God's unchanging love. The sovereign of the universe was not alone in his work of beneficence. He had an associate, a co-worker who could appreciate his purposes and could share his joy in giving happiness to created beings. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Christ, the Word, the only begotten of God, was one with the Eternal Father, one in nature, in character, in purpose, the only being that could enter into all the counsels and purposes of God. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. His goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And the Son of God declares concerning himself, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting. When he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him, as one brought up with him. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Proverbs chapter 8, verses 22 to 30. The Father wrought by his Son in the creation of all heavenly beings. By him were all things created, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Angels are God's ministers, radiant with the light ever flowing from His presence and speeding on rapid wing to execute His will. But the Son, the anointed of God, the express image of His person, the brightness of His glory, upholding all things by the word of His power, holds supremacy over them all. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. A glorious high throne from the beginning was the place of his sanctuary. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 12. A scepter of righteousness, the scepter of his kingdom. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Psalm 96, verse 6. Mercy and truth go before his face. Psalm 89, verse 14. The law of God being the foundation of the government of God, 
the happiness of all intelligent beings depends upon their perfect accord with its great principles of righteousness. God desires from all his creatures the service of love, service that springs from an appreciation of his character. He takes no pleasure in a forced obedience, and to all he grants freedom of will that they may render him voluntary service. So long as all created beings acknowledged the allegiance of love, there was perfect harmony throughout the universe of God. It was the joy of the heavenly host to fulfill the purpose of their creator. They delighted in reflecting his glory and showing forth his praise. And while love to God was supreme, love for one another was confiding and unselfish. There was no note of discord to mar the celestial harmonies. But a change came over this happy state. There was one who perverted the freedom that God had granted to his creatures. Sin originated with him, who, next to Christ, had been most honored of God and was highest in power and glory among the inhabitants of heaven. Lucifer, son of the morning, was first of the covering cherubs, holy and undefiled. He stood in the presence of the great Creator, and the ceaseless beams of glory enshrouding the eternal God rested upon him. Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 to 15. Little by little, Lucifer came to indulge the desire for self-exaltation. The scripture says, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 17. Thou hast said in thine heart, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Though all his glory was from God, this mighty angel came to regard it as pertaining to himself. Not content with his position, though honored above the heavenly hosts, he ventured to covet homage due alone to the Creator. Instead of seeking to make God supreme in the affections and allegiance of all created beings, it was his endeavor to secure their service and loyalty to himself. And coveting the glory with which the infinite Father had invested his Son, this prince of angels aspired to power that was the prerogative of Christ alone. Now the perfect harmony of heaven was broken. Lucifer's disposition to serve himself instead of his creator aroused a feeling of apprehension when observed by those who considered that the glory of God should be supreme. In heavenly counsel, the angels pleaded with Lucifer. The Son of God presented before him the greatness, the goodness, and the justice of the Creator, and the sacred, unchanging nature of his law. God himself had established the order of heaven, and in departing from it, Lucifer would dishonor his Maker and bring ruin upon himself. But the warning given in infinite love and mercy only aroused a spirit of resistance. Lucifer allowed his jealousy of Christ to prevail and became the more determined. To dispute the supremacy of the Son of God, thus impeaching the wisdom and love of the Creator, had become the purpose of this Prince of Angels. To this object he was about to bend the energies of that master mind, which next to Christ's, was first among the hosts of God. But he who would have the will of all his creatures free left none unguarded to the bewildering sophistry by which rebellion would seek to justify itself. Before the great contest should open, all were to have a clear presentation of his will, whose wisdom and goodness were the spring of all their joy. The king of the universe summoned the heavenly host before him that in their presence he might set forth the true position of his Son and show the relation he sustained to all created beings. The Son of God shared the Father's throne, and the glory of the eternal self-existent one encircled both. 
About the throne gathered the holy angels, a vast unnumbered throng, ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands. Revelation chapter 5, verse 11. The most exalted angels, as ministers and subjects, rejoicing in the light that fell upon them from the presence of the deity. Before the assembled inhabitants of heaven, the king declared that none but Christ, the only begotten of God, could fully enter into his purposes, and to him it was committed to execute the mighty counsels of his will. The Son of God had wrought the Father's will in the creation of all the hosts of heaven, and to him, as well as to God, their homage and allegiance were due. Christ was still to exercise divine power in the creation of the earth and its inhabitants. But in all this he would not seek power or exaltation for himself, contrary to God's plan, but would exalt the Father's glory and execute his purposes of beneficence and love. The angels joyfully acknowledged the supremacy of Christ, and prostrating themselves before him, poured out their love and adoration. Lucifer bowed with them, but in his heart there was a strange, fierce conflict. Truth, justice, and loyalty were struggling against envy and jealousy. The influence of the holy angels seemed for a time to carry him with them. As songs of praise ascended in melodious strains, swelled by thousands of glad voices, the spirit of evil seemed vanquished. Unutterable love thrilled his entire being. His soul went out in harmony with the sinless worshipers in love to the Father and the Son. But again, he was filled with pride in his own glory. His desire for supremacy returned, and envy of Christ was once more indulged. The high honors conferred upon Lucifer were not appreciated as God's special gift, and therefore called forth no gratitude to his Creator. He glorified in his brightness and exaltation and aspired to be equal with God. He was beloved and reverenced by the heavenly hosts. Angels delighted to execute his commands, and he was clothed with wisdom and glory above them all. Yet the Son of God was exalted above him as one in power and authority with the Father. He shared the Father's counsels, while Lucifer did not thus enter into the purposes of God. Why, questioned this mighty angel, should Christ have the supremacy? Why is he honored above Lucifer? Leaving his place in the immediate presence of the Father, Lucifer went forth to diffuse the spirit of discontent among the angels. He worked with mysterious secrecy, and for a time concealed his real purpose under an appearance of reverence for God. He began to insinuate doubts concerning the laws that govern heavenly beings, intimating that though laws might be necessary for the inhabitants of the worlds, angels being more exalted needed no such restraint, for their own wisdom was a sufficient guide. They were not beings that could bring dishonor to God. All their thoughts were holy. It was no more possible for them than for God himself to err. The exaltation of the Son of God as equal with the Father was represented as an injustice to Lucifer, who, it was claimed, was also entitled to reverence and honor. If this prince of angels could but attain to his true exalted position, great good would accrue to the entire host of heaven, for it was his object to secure freedom for all. But now even the liberty which they had hitherto enjoyed was at an end, for an absolute ruler had been appointed them, and to his authority all must pay homage. Such were the subtle deceptions that through the wiles of Lucifer were fast obtaining in the heavenly courts. There had been no change in the position or authority of Christ. Lucifer's envy and misrepresentation and his claims to equality with Christ had made necessary a statement of the true position of the Son of God. But this had been the same from the beginning. Many of the angels were, however, blinded by Lucifer's deceptions. Taking advantage of the loving, loyal trust reposed in him by the holy beings under his command, he had so artfully instilled into their minds his own distrust and discontent that his agency was not discerned. Lucifer had presented the purposes of God in a false light, misconstruing and distorting them to excite dissent and dissatisfaction. 
He cunningly drew his hearers on to give utterance to their feelings. Then these expressions were repeated by him when it would serve his purpose as evidence that the angels were not fully in harmony with the government of God. While claiming for himself perfect loyalty to God, he urged that changes in the order and laws of heaven were necessary for the stability of the divine government. Thus, while working to excite opposition to the law of God and to instill his own discontent into the minds of the angels under him, he was ostensibly seeking to remove dissatisfaction and to reconcile disaffected angels to the order of heaven. While secretly fomenting discord and rebellion, he with consummate craft caused it to appear as his sole purpose to promote loyalty and to preserve harmony and peace. The spirit of dissatisfaction thus kindled was doing its baleful work. While there was no open outbreak, division of feeling imperceptibly grew up among the angels. There were some who looked with favor upon Lucifer's insinuations against the government of God. Although they had heretofore been in perfect harmony with the order which God had established, they were now discontented and unhappy because they could not penetrate his unsearchable counsels. They were dissatisfied with his purpose in exalting Christ. These stood ready to second Lucifer's demand for equal authority with the Son of God. But angels who were loyal and true maintained the wisdom and justice of the divine decree and endeavored to reconcile this disaffected being to the will of God. Christ was the Son of God. He had been one with him before the angels were called into existence. He had ever stood at the right hand of the Father. His supremacy, so full of blessing to all who came under its benignant control, had not heretofore been questioned. The harmony of heaven had never been interrupted. Wherefore should there now be discord? The loyal angels could see only terrible consequences from this dissension, and with earnest entreaty they counseled the disaffected ones to renounce their purpose and prove themselves loyal to God by fidelity to his government. In great mercy, according to his divine character, God bore long with Lucifer. The spirit of discontent and disaffection had never before been known in heaven. It was a new element, strange, mysterious, unaccountable. Lucifer himself had not at first been acquainted with the real nature of his feelings. For a time, he had feared to express the workings and imaginings of his mind. Yet he did not dismiss them. He did not see whether he was drifting. But such efforts as infinite love and wisdom only could devise were made to convince him of his error. His disaffection was proved to be without cause, and he was made to see what would be the result of persisting in revolt. Lucifer was convinced that he was in the wrong. He saw that the Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. Psalm 145, verse 17 that the divine statutes are just, and that he ought to acknowledge them as such before all heaven. Had he done this, he might have saved himself and many angels. He had not at that time fully cast off his allegiance to God. Though he had left his position as covering cherub, yet if he had been willing to return to God, acknowledging the Creator's wisdom, and satisfied to fill the place appointed him in God's great plan, he would have been reinstated in his office. The time had come for a final decision. He must fully yield to the divine sovereignty or place himself in open rebellion. He nearly reached the decision to return, but pride forbade him. It was too great a sacrifice for one who had been so highly honored to confess that he had been in error, that his imaginings were false and to yield to the authority which he had been working to prove unjust. A compassionate creator, in yearning pity for Lucifer and his followers, was seeking to draw them back from the abyss of ruin into which they were about to plunge. But his mercy was misinterpreted. Lucifer pointed to the long-suffering of God as an evidence of his own superiority, an indication that the king of the universe would yet accede to his terms. If the angels would stand firmly with him, he declared, they could yet gain all that they desired. 
He persistently defended his own course and fully committed himself to the great controversy against his maker. Thus it was that Lucifer, the light bearer, the sharer of God's glory, the attendant of his throne, by transgression became Satan, the adversary of God and holy beings, and the destroyer of those whom heaven had committed to his guidance and guardianship. Rejecting with disdain the arguments and entreaties of the loyal angels, he denounced them as deluded slaves. The preference shown to Christ he declared an act of injustice both to himself and to all the heavenly host, and announced that he would no longer submit to this invasion of his rights and theirs. He would never again acknowledge the supremacy of Christ. He had determined to claim the honor which should have been given him and take command of all who would become his followers. And he promised those who would enter his ranks a new and better government under which all would enjoy freedom. Great numbers of the angels signified their purpose to accept him as their leader. Flattered by the favor with which his advances were received, he hoped to win all the angels to his side, to become equal with God himself, and to be obeyed by the entire host of heaven. Still, the loyal angels urged him and his sympathizers to submit to God, and they set before them the inevitable result should they refuse. He who had created them could overthrow their power and signally punish their rebellious daring. No angel could successfully oppose the law of God, which was as sacred as himself. They warned all to close their ears against Lucifer's deceptive reasoning and urged him and his followers to seek the presence of God without delay and confess the error of questioning his wisdom and authority. Many were disposed to heed this counsel, to repent of their disaffection, and seek to be again received into favor with the Father and his Son. But Lucifer had another deception ready. The mighty revolter now declared that the angels who had united with him had gone too far to return, that he was acquainted with the divine law and knew that God would not forgive. He declared that all who should submit to the authority of heaven would be stripped of their honor, degraded from their position. For himself, he was determined never again to acknowledge the authority of Christ. The only course remaining for him and his followers, he said, was to assert their liberty and gain by force the rights which had not been willingly accorded them. So far as Satan himself was concerned, it was true that he had now gone too far to return, but not so with those who had been blinded by his deceptions. To them, the counsel and entreaties of the loyal angels opened a door of hope, and had they heeded the warning, they might have broken away from the snare of Satan. But pride, love for their leader, and the desire for unrestricted freedom were permitted to bear sway, and the pleadings of divine love and mercy were finally rejected. God permitted Satan to carry forward his work until the spirit of disaffection ripened into active revolt. It was necessary for his plans to be fully developed, that their true nature and tendency might be seen by all. Lucifer, as the anointed cherub, had been highly exalted. He was greatly loved by the heavenly beings, and his influence over them was strong. God's government included not only the inhabitants of heaven, but of all the worlds that he had created. And Lucifer had concluded that if he could carry the angels of heaven with him in rebellion, he could carry also all the worlds. He had artfully presented his side of the question, employing sophistry and fraud to secure his objects. His power to deceive was very great. By disguising himself in a cloak of falsehood, he had gained an advantage. All his acts were so clothed with mystery that it was difficult to disclose to the angels the true nature of his work. Until fully developed, it could not be made to appear the evil thing it was. His disaffection would not be seen to be rebellion. Even the loyal angels could not fully discern his character or see to what his work was leading. Lucifer had at first so conducted his temptations that he himself stood uncommitted. The angels whom he could not bring fully to his side he accused of indifference to the interests of heavenly beings. The very work which he himself was doing he charged upon the loyal angels. 
It was his policy to perplex with subtle arguments concerning the purposes of God. Everything that was simple he shrouded in mystery, and by artful perversion cast doubt upon the plainest statements of Jehovah. And his high position, so closely connected with the divine government, gave greater force to his representations. God could employ only such means as were consistent with truth and righteousness. Satan could use what God could not, flattery and deceit. He had sought to falsify the word of God and had misrepresented his plan of government, claiming that God was not just in imposing laws upon the angels, that in requiring submission and obedience from his creatures, he was seeking merely the exaltation of himself. It was therefore necessary to demonstrate before the inhabitants of heaven and of all the worlds that God's government is just, his law perfect. Satan had made it appear that he himself was seeking to promote the good of the universe. The true character of the usurper and his real object must be understood by all. He must have time to manifest himself by his wicked works. The discord which his own course had caused in heaven Satan charged upon the government of God. All evil he declared to be the result of the divine administration. He claimed that it was his own object to improve upon the statutes of Jehovah. Therefore, God permitted him to demonstrate the nature of his claims, to show the working out of his proposed changes in the divine law. His own work must condemn him. Satan had claimed from the first that he was not in rebellion. The whole universe must see the deceiver unmasked. Even when he was cast out of heaven, infinite wisdom did not destroy Satan. Since only the service of love can be acceptable to God, the allegiance of his creatures must rest upon a conviction of his justice and benevolence. The inhabitants of heaven and of the worlds, being unprepared to comprehend the nature or consequences of sin, could not then have seen the justice of God in the destruction of Satan. Had he been immediately blotted out of existence, some would have served God from fear rather than from love. The influence of the deceiver would not have been fully destroyed, nor would the spirit of rebellion have been utterly eradicated. For the good of the entire universe, through ceaseless ages, he must more fully develop his principles, that his charges against the divine government might be seen in their true light by all created beings, and that the justice and mercy of God and the immutability of his law might be forever placed beyond all question. Satan's rebellion was to be a lesson to the universe through all coming ages, a perpetual testimony to the nature of sin and its terrible results. The working out of Satan's rule, its effects upon both men and angels, would show what must be the fruit of setting aside the divine authority. It would testify that with the existence of God's government is bound up the well-being of all the creatures he has made. Thus the history of this terrible experiment of rebellion was to be a perpetual safeguard to all holy beings, to prevent them from being deceived as to the nature of transgression, to save them from committing sin and suffering its penalty. He that ruleth in the heaven is the one who sees the end from the beginning, the one before whom the mysteries of the past and the future are alike outspread, and who, beyond the woe and darkness and ruin that sin has wrought, beholds the accomplishment of his own purposes of love and blessing. Though clouds and darkness are round about him, righteousness and judgment are the foundation of his throne. Psalm 97, verse 2, the Revised Version. And this the inhabitants of the universe, both loyal and disloyal, will one day understand. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4.